Grace and peace to you in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome each of you to worship here at Northwest Hills Church, United Church of Christ. Whether you are young or old, whether you are first-time or long-time worshipers, whether you come full of doubts or confidence, joy or sorrow, in this place we are all family in Jesus Christ. I am so glad that you are able to join us wherever you may be. May we grow in our knowledge and love of Christ as we worship this morning. I'd like to open our worship with a call to worship. As you hear these words from Psalm 148, may you focus your hearts and minds on our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, you great sea creatures. Praise him, lightning and hail, snow and clouds. Praise him, you mountains and hills, wild animals and all cattle. Praise him, all you rulers of the earth and all nations, young and old. Let us praise the name of the Lord, for he has set everything in its place. Praise God's holy name. Let us join together in our opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Open our hearts and minds so that your word may penetrate to the depths of our being. Lead us to the river of the living water and refresh us for the work you have set before us. Be with us and show us your glory, O Lord, as we worship in your holy presence. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I hand it over to Susie for today's children's message. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be with you this morning. During the last month, we've been talking about Queen Esther and how she saved her Jewish people. Today, we're going to celebrate Queen Esther with a festival called Purim. Purim means the festival of lots, so we'll get into that in a minute. But think about celebrations. Celebrations are always happy. And how do you celebrate? If it's a birthday celebration, you have a cake, you might sing songs, you have balloons. Sometimes you might have food and maybe even costumes. Well, first of all, I want to tell you what Purim means. Purim is the festival of lots. And if you've ever had to draw straws for something, you kind of know what this is about. If you remember in the story, Haman had to draw straws um, for to see what day he was going to kill all the Jewish people. So here I have four straws, and they look pretty even across. But the one who gets the shortest straw loses, and the one who gets the longest straw wins. So we're going to try and pull straws and see what happens here. That's pretty. We'll see if that's the longest. That one's shorter. This one's really short. And this one's medium. So if you see, if you got the short straw, you would lose. But if you got the long straw, you would win. So in Haman's case, he would have chosen this date, this would represent a day, to kill all the Jewish people. But because that didn't happen, that is why we have the festival, festival of pure or festival of lots. These are called lots when you draw straws. The other thing they do when um, during the celebration of Purim is they dress up in characters like maybe a queen or a king or maybe Mordecai or Haman. But they read the story of Esther in something called a megalot. So we are going to read the story and we're going to listen for the word Haman and we're going to do a grogger like we heard in the background. This is called a grogger and it makes noise. And the reason for this is to drown out the name of Haman because the Jewish people did not like him. So here we go with the story. So every time you hear the word Haman, clap your hands or make some loud noise so you can't hear the word. So you have to listen carefully. Here we go. Esther was one of God's people. She lived in Persia. Her parents died, so her cousin Mordecai took care of her. King Xerxes told, chose Esther to be his queen. Esther went to live in his palace. King Xerxes gave her clothes and jewels. Esther was beautiful. But Xerxes had a helper named Haman. Haman wanted to kill all God's people. He tricked the king into making a law that God's people could be killed. When Esther heard about the law, she said, I will ask the king to stop this law. But anyone who came to Xerxes without being asked could be killed, even Esther. So Esther and Mordecai and all God's people prayed. Then Esther went to King Xerxes' room. King Xerxes invited her in. God answered the prayers, and Esther was safe. Later, Esther told King Xerxes, someone wants to kill me, and my people too. Please save my life. Who would do such a terrible thing, the king asked. Esther said, the man is Haman. So King Xerxes had Haman taken away. Then King Xerxes made a new law. God's people were saved. God always wants us to do great things and do good things. So that story would have been writ read on a megala, which is the story of Esther. Something else that they do, they, ha they do gift baskets called shalak manak, which means sending gifts, but there would be little gifts and trinkets in here, maybe some little toys, or maybe some food, and I have a crown in here, but they also had cookies called Haman Shunken, and these were triangular shaped cookies that represented Haman. 
demon's hat because it was noted that he always had a triangular hat on. So this is called human coffin. They also had a special box named as the Dhaka box, and they would put coins in this box to honor the poor people. So this would be a Dhaka box. All right, let's see what else we have in here. So there's just a bunch of little sweet treats in there, but these were all ways that the Jewish people, even today, celebrate Purim, or the Festival of Lots. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word so that we can learn more about you and the brave people in the Bible, like Queen Esther and Mordecai, who were truly superheroes and saved their people from bad people like Haman. Please be with us every day and watch over us and keep us safe and healthy. In your name we pray. Amen. Hope everybody has a good week. We'll see you next Sunday. Bye. Esther then convinces King Xerxes of the evils of Haman's plan, and Xerxes has Haman executed. But we left last week on a cliffhanger. Haman is dead, but his decree against the Jewish people is still in effect. Will Esther and Mordecai be able to stop it in time, or will Haman's revenge still be carried out? This week, we finish the book of Esther, and we find out. In chapter 8, we pick up where we left off last week. Haman is dead, but the evil he set into motion against the Jewish people still lives. Because Haman was executed as a traitor to the throne, his property rightfully goes into the king's hands. And because Esther was the one wronged by Haman, Xerxes gives Esther his estate. Xerxes also gives Mordecai his signet ring, previously worn by Haman. So in this continuing line of reversals, the authority that was once held by Haman is now given to Mordecai. And while the safety of these two have now been secured by Xerxes, Esther and Mordecai's people still need to be saved. So Esther approaches Xerxes and pleads for him to send out an order reversing Haman's. So Xerxes agrees and gives Esther and Mordecai permission to send out another decree. It is noteworthy here to say that Haman's decree against the Jewish people did have Xerxes' royal signature. And it was not unusual for a monarch to refuse to revoke a law once it was publicly issued, because in doing so, he could potentially undermine his own authority in the eyes of the public. So Xerxes allows Haman's order to stand, but he also allows Esther and Mordecai to send a follow-up decree allowing the Jewish people to defend themselves when their enemies would have their attack. So Mordecai and the king's royal secretaries publish this second decree, and they send it out across the empire. Chapter 8 ends with a note that Mordecai is revered in the city of Susa, and the Jewish people living in the city begin their celebration of being saved from Haman's evil plan. Chapter 9 begins a little bit later. 
It begins on the day when Haman's plan was to be enacted. When the, Jew, when the enemies of the Jewish people begin their attack, the Jews then defend themselves. The book records that 500 men fell in Susa that day as the Jewish people defended themselves, and another 300 the next day. All in all, it's, the book records that 75,000 were dead throughout the empire when the Jewish people defended themselves. Now, the author of the book is careful to say three times, and if you remember, in Hebrew scripture, and all of the uh, scripture, if it's important, it's repeated multiple times, the author repeats three times that the Jews, quote, did not lay their hands on the plunder. The Jewish people understood that what was going on, their defense, was really an act of holy war. And one of the rules of ancient holy war was to not take the spoils, the plunder, the riches of those whom they attack. It is also noted by the author that the ten sons of Haman were also killed, leaving, leaving Haman's family totally eliminated and the possibility of evil coming from him again to, be, to, to basically be zero. After the, their enemies have been defeated, and the threat of Haman is no more, the Jewish people across the Persian Empire finally can rest in peace. And they begin to celebrate their salvation from Haman's evil plan. In a sort of epilogue to the book, the author explains that Mordecai, quote, recorded these events and sent letters to all the Jews to have them celebrate annually. This new celebration was known as Purim. Purim based on the word for the lots that Haman cast to determine the day of death for the Jewish people. It's interesting, the name Purim sort of has a, a double meaning. First, it meant, and it, re it represents and remembers how Haman threw lots, remember the, the tiny dice, the clay dice, that, or like dice that were lots, and he cast them to determine when to destroy, to enact his revenge against the Jewish people. But the other meaning is that in the end, the Jewish people are not destroyed. And that truly, it wasn't in Haman's hands, but it's God who determines the destiny of his people. Purim was to be celebrated by future generations to remember the story of Queen Esther and her cousin Mordecai and the great deliverance of their ancestors which permitted each successive generation to exist. And so they have, and they still do. There are a lot of topics and themes I could talk about here that are seen within and through the book of Esther, but I want to focus on one that I think we need to hear today. As I mentioned a few weeks back when we started the book of Esther, God is seemingly nowhere to be found in the events of the lives of Esther and Mordecai. Yet the author of the book and us, the audience, who are people of faith, we really don't allow these events with Esther and Mordecai to simply be chalked up to coincidences or random chance. While unseen, we believe that God truly did work through the events of Esther and Mordecai in order to bring about his redemptive plan, God's redemptive plan. And because the Jewish people survived the evil plans of Haman, when we go down the road, the timeline, we, we realize 
that God, through this event, was able to bring forth his redemptive plan years down the road through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I also mentioned before how this book, the beauty of this book, is because it reflects the reality of our own lives. God works the same way today as he did in the book of Esther. We too live in a time when miraculous displays of God's power are not the way God does things. Yet we, as people of faith, as Christians, are called and expected to believe in God's power and presence in our lives. I think the book of Esther invites each of us, as Christians, to think about our faith in a world where God is unseen. When we reflect upon our own lives, we have the options. We can say that everything that happens in our lives has simply happened by, by, by mere coincidence or random chance. Or maybe, just maybe, we can entertain the possibility of an unseen cause behind the events in our lives. The author of the letter to the Hebrews defines faith as, quote, being sure of what we hope for, and this is, this is the important part, certain of what we do not see. As Christians, as people of faith, we trust in an unseen God who works beyond or behind the events that we do see. We trust that God watches over us. We trust that God guides us along the path of our lives. What exactly God does, what exactly God influences, what exactly he puts into place we, we probably won't know on this side of eternity. But we believe that God is still working in this world today, working in the lives of people, you and me, ultimately for his glory and for the benefit of his people. So as we wrap up this series, uh, this time that we've spent in the book of Esther, Perhaps this is a, a great time, a great opportunity, maybe even a challenge to open ourselves to the creative and unexpected ways God works in us and through us. Maybe, just maybe, we can relax just a bit more to know that both the best, the, the best moments in our lives, the worst moments in our lives, and, and everything in between are all a part of what God is doing in us and through us, not only for our own benefit, for our own good, but also for the benefit and good of others. That truly all things work together for good. One of the major lessons Susie has been talking about and, and I've been learning myself through these last few months of the corona pandemic, coronavirus pandemic, is the fact, the truth, that God is in control. I am not, but God is. We may not see him. We may not understand what is going on within our circumstances but we trust that God is working through all of this for our good. So I hope that we do have faith and trust in something, someone whom we cannot see. We may not be able to see the end of all of this, all this stuff that we're going through currently, but the story of Esther, if it has taught me anything, and I hope it's taught you this, that we don't have to. We don't have to see the end from where we are because we trust and know and have faith that God has it. God has it in his hands. That God is still in control. 
working for the good for both you and me. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, King of all creation, you are worthy of our worship and praise. Yours is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord. We adore you as the one who is over all things. You are God, and there is no other. There is none like you. All praise and glory and honor be to your name. Oh, Heavenly Father, there are days when we wonder how the pieces and events of our lives fit together. As you worked in the lives of Esther and Mordecai so long ago, we know that you work in our lives today. You are the author of life. Help us to trust that you are with us in both the best and the worst of times and everything in between. That you work all things together for good, whether in this life or in your heavenly realm. Oh Lord, as we trust that you are good and that you do good, we pray for so many today. We continue to lift up the sick and infected. Help and heal them, O oh God. Contain the spread of infection. We pray for the, the vulnerable of our population. Protect our elderly and those who are at risk. We pray for our local and state and federal government leaders and health leaders. Help them in combating this pandemic. We pray for our scientific community. Help them understand the virus and give them the knowledge on how to fight it. We lift up those who are still out of jobs and are facing financial hardship. Keep them from panic and inspire your church to support them. And we lift up all the others who are affected by this pandemic. Hear us, O Lord of life. Grant us grace and courage and wisdom for the facing of these days. We also lift up the prayers that are on our hearts and minds. O oh, ever faithful God, we offer up these prayers to you, joining our voices with the great chorus of those who have journeyed in faith before us. We long for that day when all your children will live in your peace and praise your name. Until that day, give us sturdy patience and enduring hope, all rooted in your love. I pray this through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, let us join together in our closing hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
brings our service. May you go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you so that God's ways may be known upon the earth and God's saving power be among all the nations of the world. Go in Christ's peace.